Hey, Mark, there are a lot of gurus out there. What makes you so special? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> My mission is to help 20 billion men and women. It's about the mission and the values and the billion. vision and the customer. <laughs> because yeah. it's about the mission. Mission? My mission was about the mission. My humble mission. Listen, listen. It's yeah. about the mission and the values. Honestly, I'm mission driven. Yeah. I'm a mission driven. Mm. Oh, yeah. Hello oh. and welcome to Gym World Worldwide. We have a very special live edition coming wow. at you from a random penthouse in Austin, yes. Texas. Okay. Uh, so enjoy the view and, and enjoy our guest. Uh, it is our old co-host or sort of co-host. I, I, like, I, I, I like to think uh, of co-host the... emeritus. Yeah. Uh, when yeah so I think I'm sort of like the the foundational guest host, maybe like yeah. the yeah, yeah, you're the glue, the, the rock, the yeah. rock, the, the rock, rock. Uh, Mark. Fisher of Mark Fisher Fitness, of Business for Unicorns, a visionary leader, a fitness business guru, the inventor of Snatched in Six Weeks, yeah. and um, yeah, and now he's a dad too. So I am also dad. Do, doing dad stuff. Welcome. We're here at, uh, at your event to pedal yeah. our software, Kilo. Yep. And, uh, if you're in the, yep. if you're in uh, the neighborhood and you're looking for a website. A CRM, some marketing automation software, a little gym management software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, head over to usekilo.com and um, book your sales oh, call today. Yeah, that was so yeah. smooth. And uh, and you know, like and subscribe uh, Gym World Worldwide while you're here. And um, and if you're desperate for new members, if you're just so poor, right thirsty, now, and you need to learn how to get more. You can inquire. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't use your NLP for that purpose. You use your NLP to drive your own businesses. So what are we doing here, Mark? What do, what, what do you got going on this weekend? Well, we're doing our Unicorn Society retreat, which is where we gather together our community and do some in-person learning, connecting, a combination of uh, cool experiences outside the event. We get to hang out with fun, awesome people like you. We bring in guest speakers. Very excited. Actually, a pal I haven't seen in many years. Jordan Syatt, who you might know if you know the online fitness space, was formerly Gary V's trainer, but also right. a yes. very successful and accomplished oh. online fitness trainer who's a really massive business, and we're really excited to learn from him. And uh, yeah, it'll just be a fun chance to get the community together and get out of the businesses, be around like-minded people, do some, some visioning, some goal planning, and you know, get clear on how you're going to go hopefully improve your gym. We've talked about uh, Mark Fisher Fitness, your gym, on the show before. Yes. We, and, uh, you know, maybe we can get to that. I know you are on a time crunch. You're very in demand here <laughs> yeah, since I everyone, am. it's it's essentially like your wedding. Everyone yeah. is vying for yeah. your time. Yes. Um, Look at this. I've made time to hang out with you at my birthday party. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm having an extended conversation with you at my birthday party. Sorry, other guests. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. It's actually, you're in a different space. So it's like almost like the couple's table at the wedding. You yeah. know, this yeah. is this is That's a table. That's true. So, you guys are working with with what, like a, around a hundred gyms now? Uh, one hundred and twenty-five ish. Yeah. Oh wow! Congratulations, yeah. uh, going up in the world. Yeah. yeah. And so you're gonna be you're gonna be hammering them. You're gonna be giving them some tips, some keys to the castle on Value. how to become uh, a trillionaire gym Value. owner such as yourself. Um, yes. what, what are some of the most like common mistakes some of these gym owners are making, and uh, and how do we yeah. fix them? How do we? Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot. Of <laughs> so I love, I love many things owners. to fix. Yeah. yeah so I, I broken. Mean, you know, there, there are kind of a handful. <laughs> The only way to fix them is to pay me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, can, you can fix them on your own. I mean, the, the handful of things that, like, I tend to go to is, you know, like a lot of people that do what I do, I have a handful of benchmarks of, like, here are some primary things that if these numbers are awry, we have some challenges. Um Certainly, I think most people know that you want a certain percentage profitability and certain, you know, what we call total owner compensation. If you're not there, like that's kind of a challenge. As a part of that, we want to be careful that we're paying our staff not too much. Now, you can pay your staff too little, but what's, what's the magical number? Let me interrupt you. I like, word. for me, I like for non owner people, 40%. 40%. Sorry, for non-owner people. Yep. So this is total people cost. Now I say forty percent because oh, I'm talking about you said the the profit, the profit, the gym owner. How much if you are made, like what is the target? So total, I think minimum total owner compensation. Yes. Which I would define as a combination of salary, distribution, and perks. I like to be at least twenty percent, 
and then that can be up to 40% or more. So and it's then, not an actual number. You, you, not you teach like percentage. a percent. Yeah. Now I'd say like crudely the number that, you know, the, yeah, uh, what does everyone want to make the hive what mind? Yeah, yeah. 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 The hive yeah. minds kind of landed around like in most markets, crudely a hundred K net owner benefit is a Hasn't thing. Changed. <laughs> yeah. Hasn't changed. Yeah. And part of it's because it's a round number. Part of it's also because, you know, the average boutique gym in America, another, I think target to shoot for, for revenue, which can vary wildly, but average revenue, you should be able to hit 300, 350 in most markets, right? And there maybe there's some where that's very, very hard to do. And there's others where that's probably not even going to do it because all the costs mm -hmm. are so much higher. You have to do more than that. But in practice, you know, it makes the math simple, right? It's a little reductionistic, but you're thinking 300, 350, you're, you know, getting about a third of it maybe. So 100K total owner compensation, usually pretty good. But you have a partner, uh, yeah. Michael Keeler, who's been yeah. on the show. And yep. uh, how, do, how does that work out? Because a lot of these people, they have, you know, they'll be hitting the top line number, but they have a partner or two partners or got yeah. three, four partners. Like yep. it becomes pretty difficult to, uh, you know, milk one of these gyms yep. for yep. You know, 10K a month for yes. three or four different yes. partners. Like, do you advise people to not have a partner? Uh, when, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> you know, we, we just did a... a chat recently about partners, because I, I do think partners are perilous. I think a lot of people want partners, but there's two mistakes I think people make when they go to get a partner. Number one, they don't choose someone with a different skill set. Mm -hmm. So as the old, probably apocryphal saying goes, old time I think it was IBM, if two executives agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So if you both want to be the great program design person, like that's going to be presented issue number one. And then number two, oftentimes people will get a partner because they're just kind of afraid to be alone, right? They just like the idea of like, oh, well, I got my buddy and we can sort of, and, and I don't mean to dismiss that as having no value, right? Because it is partly a mental game. So I, I get that, but that's usually not the best reason to uh, have a partner. Now, as far as your question, as far as the way the economics change when you have partners, well, in theory, now the total owner compensation could be a much higher percentage because, you know, here's another way to think about it. If, if it's two of you and you have one part-time trainer, you're both very happy to be on the floor. Well, two really highly motivated people, you might be able to have a gym that's pulling in 500K right. and now your non-people costs because you are able to do so much of the business between the two of you, I should say, sorry, your non-owner people costs. Might be like pretty low because you got like one maybe full time person, then and you don't really have to do them anything. They don't have to do a lot of batteries included stuff because you have two owners working on the business full time. So it, it can work, but at that point you you probably can't do twenty percent as your minimum. You're gonna need to do more. Push closer to forty, which will get you to exactly two hundred thousand. Oh, oh, oh wow, wow. Look, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the theme of this weekend is sales and marketing. That's right. The, That's right. Oh, so wow. What wow. are we, uh, you know, what, what product is great for sales? And marketing? <laughs> I wasn't that out at all. No, I, I wanted to is know more of that NLP stuff. No, I wanted to know what, um, is anything, are there any new hot secrets that you're coming in to, uh, present to your group or, or you're bringing in people that have unlocked a new mm. 2024. Have you found um, those 10 yeah, women that are looking to transform yeah. their body? Yeah. Yeah. Six weeks. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Uh, it's, uh, or, or are we more, uh, reminding instead of, uh, Educating yeah. I mean, I, it, I'll say if there is something brand new out there that people are doing that's really new, I don't know what it is. Um, I will say this, I think, to get hyper specific and kind of tactical here, I do think sell by chat, at least in our world, has been underutilized. And we've been seeing some of our members having like great strides with running a sell by chat strategy. Those that are not familiar, this is a simply trying to engage in text based conversations. It's most commonly leveraged on a platform like Instagram. You could do it on Facebook, you could do it on LinkedIn, not usually right for our industry. You could also do it on emails. But you have to do it right because you have to both get the conversation started and you have to keep the conversation going. And there are some real pitfalls you can fall into because sometimes when people do and they don't have a really good system for it, they just kind of get friend zoned. And they're just like, I know I'm supposed to be chatting. And I heard John said conversations equal conversions. So I'm yeah. chatting with a lot of people and I'm just like, do you like ice cream? I like <laughs> ice cream. What's your favorite flavor, right? So it is a little bit of an art because on the it's other hand. from like the gym account. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. The, the, on the other hand, too, you also don't want to be like, you know, sell by like interrogation. It's like, you know, where you're constantly just like drilling them and great. Uh, you want to book an appointment? Yeah. I, I mean, no. the, the godfather, godfather, godfather of this whole system that 
be bequeathed on the rest of us came down from the heavens and was like, here you are, children of Machina, take it. Um, broadly seems to be a guy named Dean Jackson, who super nerds might have heard of. And one of the his sayings as far as how one approached the strategy, which is so brilliant, which is, you know, all all cheese, no whiskers. Right? The more the more you can be like, mm, you wanna join a gym? You're looking for a gym? I see you follow my Instagram crowd. I'm wondering, do you have do you want to maybe do my gym? Um, um, yeah. um but again, it, you have to balance, I think, both of those. So we'll be showing some very specific scripts and verbiage. Because the other thing that I found, too, is very interesting is one of the things people get hung up on is like they literally just don't know what the words are. And if there's one thing I've come around luck, reluctantly, I think, to accept is how prescriptive, at least in the beginning, one needs to be about a lot of these things. Because, you know, a lot of people are like, got it, have conversations. And they just like don't know what to say. So that's part of what I'll be covering. So that is feels newish for some people in our world. And I'll be excited for people to do that. The most common ones are like someone follows your account. Yep. Or someone comments on a post or likes yep. a post. Or I know some people do like stories where they'll do mm -hmm. quizzes or yep. anything like yep. that. And then you can Text see who did the quiz. Biceps from my bicep guide. Yeah. Oh, how's yeah, the yeah. bicep guide I sent you? <laughs> yeah. Because there are, in fact, you know, there's probably like uh, six to seven different triggers that you could do. And then, you know, this is, of course, the challenge because if you don't have a lot of social intuition, this can spiral really quickly and get kind of complex because the way you might open a chat when someone asks for a lead magnet might be different the way you open a chat if somebody's like a new follower. It's like not like that complicated, but you know, sometimes people need help <laughs> when they're being very specific. And uh, I heard you've kind of switched up your front end offer a little bit here. What, what are you peddling these yeah, days? Yeah, How, yeah, yeah. What, what, what are you sending in the chats? How are we? We, we have indeed. Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, the first thing I'll say is one, one thing that's new since last we chatted is I... I'm re really kind of out of the day to day of much of MFF, so I'm pretty looped into what's going on. But Emily, uh, who is here this weekend, who is our director of possibilities, friend of the podcast, friend of the podcast, uh, Sheriff Alex, who's our general manager. I mean, they're really kind of uh, running the show along with our fitness is that his director, title? Chris. Sheriff? Sheriff, yeah. He's the sheriff. Okay, cool. Sheriff. <laughs> yeah. He reports to the chief imagination officer. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who happens to be my dog, Gizmo. Yeah. So. <laughs> So at any rate, so the, what Emily is doing right now, we actually just had a good like low bear offer, good old debate. Actually, it sparked because I was really taken with uh, the debate that you had with Keeler when he was on about low bear offer. And I'm not gonna lie, I was I'm pretty intrigued by some of the things that you all brought up on there. So I'll tell you, here's kind of the way that I'm thinking about it right now, is I and here's the the other bit of context I'll give is. We all know that when, also when you're broadly making these suggestions, it's difficult not only because the models are different, but you have different skill, frankly, of the operator. The gyms are, frankly, the training is better or worse. The service is better for worse. You have different amounts of capacity. You have different kinds of service offerings. And all of them will lead to different like offers. So I don't know. There's two ones that I think like make sense. I think if you're going to go low bearer offer for most small group personal training gyms or large group personal training these days, I'm liking a 14-day unlimited whatever you offer for $49.99. If you want to go to volume route, get them on in there, right? But I like having a mid-high ticket as your go-to option, and then that can kind of be the down sell. So in the beginning, if I just want to make it simple for somebody, and they're like, I just don't know what to do, it's like put a wrapper on it, give it a name. I like 14 days because we're moving through the sales cycle fast enough. I like being unlimited because it makes it simple. So if you have multiple things, you can be prescriptive in your first call to get them in there. And then, of course, you're going to build in a strategy session so you can have a, a real consultative sales moment where you're going to help them get clear on the gap, get clear on what they want, get clear on why it matters, and then make some sort of offer for them to move into some sort of membership. So in a vacuum, what's great about that is it gets, it's simple, right? Because you can put that everywhere. And that that offer can live on your website, your Instagram profile. You can offer and sell by chats. You can even do ads to it, right? Um, the downside is it's a little like generic, -y, right? It's, it's cool if somebody knows I want to try this gym. It's like, okay, great. I'm going to try this gym. This is a simple way to do it. Uh, of course, there's a money back guarantee, so you can get your $49 back. That's a real issue for you. No problem there. No hassle money back guarantee. But the downside is if they don't, they're not already kind of interested in your gym, it's not like a sexy offer, right? It's not like a promise you can taste and touch and right. point to. So I do like some sort of mid-tickety. So if we want to call that like the kickstart archetype, 
I like having a challenge archetype, which is maybe like a four to six week thing that's longer, depending on your market. Now we're maybe four ninety nine, maybe to seven ninety nine. Uh, it's going to be obviously like a bigger sales conversation. But if someone's really ready to make some change, they want some more support. Similarly, I like the idea of it's like in theory unlimited, but you're going to sim- same thing. But now instead of prescribing two weeks, I'm prescribing over the six weeks. We're going to keep a discovery call to get you started. And now we're also going to add in one or two nutrition coaching moments in there too, because we're also going to have to address nutrition as well. Sounds really familiar. I don't know where you got these <laughs> yeah, ideas yeah. from. Okay, cool. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we did. Um, and I've always been intrigued about the the other way you just, you started off talking about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, we, that's how exactly how we sold it. We took a six week, but it was just our normal offering. It's like you get yeah. personal training, yeah. you get classes and it's what we normally do anyway. We just called it something else for the ads. Yep. The LBO was always tough. CrossFit never got into the LBO thing because there was always like the learning curve and on ramp. Yeah, and so like, it, you know, a lot of CrossFit people listening to this, you might be glazing over, but like, yeah, it's, it's one of the downsides is you probably just don't want somebody, if someone who's deconditioned, not used to barbell training, you're doing yeah. large group class, you don't want to throw them in for two weeks. That's, yeah. <clears throat> That's, I mean, even at MFF, right, that was part of, a, had been an adventure for us too, but on a much lower level. Now we're not doing like Olympic lifting, but the fact, even though we have like kettlebell swings in there and we'd played with everything over the years, right? Because what was so great about our snatched our, like the original six week challenge, the pre six week challenge, six week challenge is we're just going to like force you because we're charging, you know, money and like you, the, a lot of buy-in when people are doing that program. But the first two weeks famously and always controversially were like workshops, where I'm mm-hmm. like, nope, I'm going to teach you how to hinge. Right. Um, and we kind of got away with it and still get away with it because people, when they do that, know that they're into it. But then we had this other issue of like, okay, well, if someone doesn't want to do that and they go right into our memberships or a trial. And you know, at one point we had, here's something not to do, tales from Mark's <laughs> dumb past. At one point we used to make them do a three class sequence. Okay. Ninja baptism. It was three classes at very weird times. <laughs> they had to do them in order. Uh, I mean, this sounds... I mean, it's like, how, how hard can I make it be oh, for you no. to start? How hard can I make it that be? That was the standard for CrossFit gyms. Okay. For it still time. is in a lot of ways. Okay. Like, yeah. we definitely did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You want to work out... You want to join the gym, you just have to come Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday <laughs> at 9 p.m. Yeah, yeah. And if 3 p.m. You, you miss Wednesday, on the weekend. you'll have <laughs> yeah. to start over again yeah. next yes. week. Oh, you know? yeah. We definitely, definitely did that <laughs> a lot. Yeah. And is it less expensive? No, it's more expensive. Yes. Yes. Because we have to set aside time and a special code just for this thing. So Um, I think that, you know, the program design takeaway for me at this point in my career is, you know, the value of self-limiting exercise. And, you know, this is something that uh, I think anybody that gets serious about this, you're always thinking about. It's how do I marry what I think is a best in class fitness product, but that actually is a good business solution. And I would note, it's not the similar to the previous conversation we were having before where You know, if I'm deciding what I want to, in a vacuum, recommend to gym owners, I actually have to consider, okay, what is, like, the average gym owner going to benefit from here, not what, like, the superheroes, right? One of my, you know, constant contrarian hobby horses I've talked a lot about with love is, is my... Not a criticism, but an observation about many of the guests of the show is they do things that most people can't get away with because they're just such an unbelievably good operator that like, yeah, of course that like works for you. You're a complete, you know, mutant. And I mean, that is a compliment. We just had James Pratt on like immediately before this. He's like, I think he's like your poster child example of like, don't copy James if you want to get rich. Yeah. And listen, to be clear, there's like a lot you can learn from him, but I think a lot of it is emulating uh, and I think it's other challenge too, because you look on the outside and the things that are maybe obvious are not necessarily always the things you want to model, right? The thing about James is that's hard to describe is his energy is just, he's just, he has like a real certainty, but like a warmth and like a power and a sort of like safety he creates him. I mean, you're like, I, I want to train with this guy. And that same skill that made him ridiculously successful as a trainer also, and this happens sometimes too with high-level trainers, that's not dissimilar from a skill of leadership. Now, there's other things you need for leadership, right? That's not the whole game. But if you're like, I just trust this person, this person just like is certainty and power, but also warmth and makes me feel good. And they cast the vision. It's like, oh, all right, I'm in. Yeah, sign me up, sign me up. And that's not everybody's like skill set, right? It's not to say that people can't be good leaders. I think there's different types to leadership, but certainly that is one I've seen work very well. And he's... 
amazing. I mean, he's one of the best I've seen at that for sure. All right. So we said if you are a gym owner, you want uh, three to five hundred in top line. You want to make a hundred thousand a year. Uh, but some, Curly. some people more. Curly. Yeah. Uh, we said you want to keep staff expense at around. 40 percent is that like was that your magic yeah, number I, mean, I don't mind going up to you know i know the the uh was it the four nines model like i think yeah, it can go up to 45 because here's the other thing too like bottom line at the end of the day it's like are you making enough personal income because if so obviously if you have a much larger gym maybe you're comfortable with a smaller slice of a larger pie um so the percentages aren't where they need to be but your actual net take home is okay right and the other, I think, question that gets very, very subjective is, do you feel you are being sufficiently financially compensated for the stresses and risks inherent of running a business, right? And that's going to, different people will shake out on different sides of that. Never. I know. <laughs> I mean, well, listen, the challenge we also see, and I know this has been a case for a lot of us too, and I love you listeners, this might be applied to some of you too, is the person comes in with a real baggage about money and they don't like money and they kind of feel bad if they're making money doing this thing because they they want to help people and they're also like not good with money. So that's another piece of it that they don't say out loud is like, I'm kind of afraid of money and I don't like money because I've never had any. So that is, I think, my caveat to saying like, yes, it, it, the final determinant is like, are you happy with what you're getting paid for your effort, stress, liability, et cetera? But that's assuming you've got a healthy enough perspective with money that that's reasonable. It can't be like, no, no, I make $10,000 a year. That's fine. That's all I need. Ten, it's for the people. $10,000 a year for 80 hours per week. That's no problem with me. I feel great about that. It's like, well, I want to challenge you to do more. Right? Because <laughs> um, I do it to help people. You know, I don't, I don't do it because I don't do it because <laughs> yeah, I need yeah, to do yeah, it. Yeah, I do yeah. it to help people. So there was at a different event we went to, there was a conversation that came up based off of the state of the your group report that you guys put out about data. And we were and they were talking about payment. And like that was one of the things like the most profitable gym owners kept their costs under control. Yeah. So you're somebody who's been operating a a long time. Yeah. You're somebody who has had very bloated expenses before. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. For and sure. I'm sure you've had to go into situations where you had to fire people who were making too much money or maybe, you know, have a decreased pay or yeah, move yeah, full time yeah, to yeah, part time yeah, or yeah. have these really convers like these really yep. difficult conversations yep. that I had to go through too. Never feels very good, but like yes. ultimately will like save your business. Um, how do you think about that? Like if you have a, like I know every gym owner out there probably has that one person on their team that is like if I could just pay them yeah. what the market wage was, like yes. we would be like, yes. okay, yes. but like yes. I, they're my yes. friend yes. and like, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's so really hard. hard and it yeah. just like lingers in their head for yeah. years. Like, yeah. how do you, how do you like counsel people through that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's first of all, I mean, the first thing I, when I counsel the people as I do, cause this is, I mean, maybe the most common mistake because the most common mistake is a gym owner. You're like, I'm going to right the wrongs of my mm -hmm. evil boss. I'm going to pay my team. You know, what's fair. You keep, you're doing most of the work. You keep 90%. 10% good enough for me, right? They're not factoring. It's like, all right, we already lost 3% for credit card. <laughs> Their payroll, because you're on W-2 actually is more than that. So you're actually in the hole for every session that they do. So we see some version of this kind of uh, issue. So I just want I start by normalizing being like, that's normal. I almost don't know anybody that didn't mess it up kind of when they started. Now, as far as what you do, it's challenging, right? So like the real talk is like, there's not an obvious thing. It's usually a combination of certainly if you can find ways to grow your revenue while keeping not letting that go up concurrently, that's one piece of it, right? So depending on how your pay is set, if you get more revenue, but your payroll it, absolute number doesn't go up, the percentage goes down. So that's usually part of the solution. The second obvious solution is as new people come in, you would then be paying them what is a more appropriate market rate. And then, yeah, your third piece is like the emergency hatch, which is ugly and it's hard and it's never very satisfying to do, but is find a way to change that person's pay. And it's like you said, there's a few ways to do that. You could restructure their pay so that they are, you know, move to more of a part time position. You could ask them and this in emergencies you can do this to actually just make less money the problem is there's almost no way that ever works right because the person is always anchored to what they were making and as much as they might intellectually understand you messed up you didn't have bad intentions they might understand i don't when i look at you know the other places i can go nowhere else seems to be hiring a, a salary trainer for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars per year so <laughs> This is very annoying for me. This is very surprising. <laughs> um, it just still. What did I do wrong? Yeah, it's still so hard to to pull that off. The other thing that I've seen people do that that might.
might work with a certain, if you get very lucky, is if there actually happens to be something the business needs that's very valuable that they can do. Uh, per, but again, it, you know, that'd be such a specific scenario because usually when you're fixing this, you're still a little bit green, right? Usually you're not like, oh, I have this very sophisticated, successful gym and now I'm ready to step back. So I'm okay if my total owner compensation goes down a little bit because I would actually prefer to have more time and I'm okay with like not making a ton more money. So you're going to be doing some of my job now, like at the owner level. I guess that could work, but that would have to be a very specific situation with a specific gym and a specific employee. And another thing to think about is, uh, you know, this is something that Pete talked about and that I learned from Pete is the idea that like, it's totally okay if people outgrow your business. Yes. And yes. I think that's the least often talked about thing. Like you'll have this rock star, you'll have this person, yep. you've increased their comp yep. because yep. they're better and better and better. But like, the reality is if you're running a $30,000 a month gym, there is a very like clear there ceiling. There's a limit. Yeah. There's <laughs> a limit. If you want to, uh, you know, have a healthy business. Yeah. And so just because they started with you or it's their first job, it, you know, the, the way Pete talks about it, I think it's like, this isn't going to be your last job, but yep. let me help you get wherever you need to go in the fitness industry. I mean, and that's historically been where we got to with MFF, right? In the beginning, what I did wrong, I was like, oh, we're all, you're all going to have gyms. Not in a fact, team family. We'll start airlines. <laughs> you know, we're like virgin, you know? Um, yeah, even the family thing. I remember that, that day where I was like, it's not family, Mark Fisher. We got rid of the alias email. And one day I was like, everyone, the new alias email is team Mark Fitness. And let's tell you why. Um, so yeah, so again, like- And you're I, all fired. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I made a lot of those mistakes, but what we started doing several years ago was, was just that. In fact, literally when we onboard trainers, I'm like, look, I really want you to be here for at least two years unless we mess up. Three years is good. Uh, we probably don't want you here more than three years and let, we can take it when we get there. And that's a very special situation. Because listen, again, there are exceptions, right? I think also, depending on the makeup of your team, and this is you know another one of my hobby horses, if you're in a type of market where there's just not that other much employment opportunity and your you know modest payment for that person like is kind of a good fit, and they're just not looking to light the world on fire, but they're a good employee, you might get lucky. You might find people who've been there. And, and Lord knows, I've had many employees that were there for years and years and years. But, you know, even a place like MFF, it's not clear, like, like there's a couple people that have like real career opportunities and everyone else. The thing that I've tried to do is make it just not weird to look for other jobs. Right. And like, without getting like too much into like, our, you know, MFFs, this is a tales of MFFs, dirty laundry. <laughs> I mean, there was a point where I was seriously considering making the whole team reapply because people were just not leaving. And the problem is you start like getting like frustrated by all these things. And it's like, and obviously listen, as a leader, you have to take feedback. Are there things I could be doing better? Sure. I think that the, the, the company can be doing better always, but at a certain point, it's like, I think you're just not happy here. And that's the other challenge when you create a really compelling job and a compelling culture and give like relatively good benefits compared to a lot of the other options. It, it, to their defense, it's not that obvious where else to go. So even though they might be more and more aware of of, I don't want to be here. Like it's not always clear what they do next, and particularly at MFF because we had a fair number of people that really didn't want to be in the fitness industry. They just they just want to work in Mark Fisher Fitness, right? And it was more of an issue when you know everybody was uh, getting married to each other and taking turns officiating each other's wedding. And I mean, it was so. Colty and so easy to deal with HR issues. I mean, listen, listen, yeah, there yeah. was, we've had a lot of people sign like love contracts over the years for sure. Um, and listen, m m on balance, that worked definitely more for us than against us. Did it come at a little bit of a, a cost for my feelings and well being at times? Like maybe, uh, you know, it certainly led to some issues. The other thing for better or for worse too is, if, and this is like, you know, thin gruel and comfort for anybody feeling like, oh, this is all intractable. It's like, well, Hang out for a couple of years. On a long enough time scale, it's going to take care of itself. Like that, that person who thinks it's going to be there forever is not. And then every time, at least my experience of this, and this is maybe like warm, happy thoughts for anyone on there, is every time I've hired another person, and again, we're well past 100 employees at this point, like it's another chance of like, ah, okay, here's the thing I, I've realized now that I need to say up front to set up that expectations. Because like, I think like that's not a weird thing. And in fact, what, what Pete does in his business is they literally sign... I think they signed one or two year contracts. 
and they say you don't get a third year unless like you really you have to really apply and you have to sell me but generally speaking after two years you're going to go out now most of you can't do that right most people don't have that kind of internship pipeline but i do think at the very least one potential takeaway is normalizing for new hires even your current team that this is not going to be your last job my intention is to help you grow as a human being and as a professional and to be better at all the things you do i want you to have as much career and financial opportunities you can and there's going to be limits right another thing too at mff that we got around to is having clearly communicated standards and very specific specific standards for here's exactly what you get raises for here's the exact range of pay this is what you start at this is the most you'll ever make per hour here's the most you could ever make if you're at the top tiers of all of these things because that was another thing too that i think until a couple years ago was a source of a little bit of confusion for everyone on the team right because you don't know what other people are making you're like well, what can I make here? And they're not in the business. They're not doing the math. They're not looking at the expense ratio. So I found that, yeah, I guess maybe it's not a surprise, but once we like got all that out there, actually, it made like pay raises much easier, just made the team at least just have more clarity on like, okay, here's what this can be. And then they can decide, right? If that's something that they want to do for years and years, they, we're, we're transparent up front. And if not, uh, they know that it's they can start making other plans, and that also I will support that. <laughs> I will I will support that. I will write you the letters. So what happens then if um, and maybe because you just said some people didn't want to actually be in the fitness industry, just like working for you. But what happens if like yes, uh, actually I only have like two or three leadership positions and they're all filled. You're a kick ass. You've been here for two years, but this yeah you we can part ways. Like oh, okay great, I'm gonna go then and open this one down the street and take like a quarter of your members, half your members, just because I have nothing else to do now. Um, the yeah. trick is to be in New York where it costs half a million dollars to be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> right. we, we are lucky. We have, uh, we have some, <laughs> some natural obstacles yeah, in my yeah, natural yeah. environment. There yeah. are some, uh, some moats. Your moats that you didn't even have to build yourself. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, two things. The first thing I will say is like, I want to be clear, it's not so much they loved working for me. They loved Mark Fisher Fitness. Yeah, yeah. Some, some did, but I think, you know, they... Yes, yes, right. The, um, the, it's really not perfectly clear. And some of those people, part of the issue is they didn't particularly like working for me. They just <laughs> liked the business. Um, then I think... As far as that, that I, I think probably is a concern in some markets. I think both because of New York City, but also, you know, I got to say it's interesting again, like thinking through this on balance, we just, I just haven't had many people that truly had those sort of entrepreneurial uh, chops as well as just ambitions to just work that hard, to just take on that much risk, to learn these other skills. And I think, I, I don't know if this is true or not. Like I, my, <laughs> I would like to think what is true is that because Mike and I were so transparent about what was going on and going through, the other thing I know many of them have said is like, I don't want your yeah, job. Yeah, that yeah, one's yeah. impossible. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to... That I don't want to do what you do. Mm -hmm. So I think for some of them, perhaps because of the transparency of the way we ran the business, it was very clear that that's just not the flavor of shit sandwich they want to eat. You know, like I think it's delicious, but I got it. So if you're having a tough time out there, gym owners, make sure your staff knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> make sure that's very clear at every staff meeting. Show them the books and show them your bank account. And then, yeah, they won't, uh, they won't want to have a coup <laughs> and take over, right? So there you have it. I know you're on a time crunch. We'll we'll wrap it up here shortly. Um, lower the pay on everybody on your team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, that, that, that's it. That's it. That's how you. That's a guaranteed 100 percent way to make more money. And, that, that and that's coming directly from it. Mark Fisher. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Mark, uh, if uh, people uh, want to learn more about uh, you and working for you and, <laughs> <laughs> and apply for a job at MFF, where do they go? I'll pay you fairly. Uh, no, you can. Uh, where's the best place to find me? Go to Business for Unicorns on Instagram these days, at Business for Unicorns. That's the best place to go. You can also go to businessforunicorns.com, and you can go to my Instagram if you want to look at pictures of my baby. Uh, I'll tell you, she's a pretty, she's a pretty sexy baby. Okay. <laughs> it's like I told my yeah. wife, she's going to be beating off those boys and girls and thems with a stick. She's going to be, okay. Uh, the stick. Okay, okay, got it. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be like that too. It'll be like, Papa. Yeah. But then she'll right. look at them coyly. Well, that's Mark Fisher, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good. Got a lot of sexy baby jokes. They own brand.